So right now, a lot of us are working from home, which means both our personal and professional information are at risk from oh, cyber criminals, The Matrix, Bill Gates, which is why I use today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, an app that encrypts 100% of the data being transmitted between your device and the internet, keeping your information private and safe. And that's not all. Once your working day is done, ExpressVPN also lets you reroute your connection to different server locations, so you can access streaming content from all around the world. And why is this something you'd want to do? Well, while the US has the largest number of shows and movies on Netflix, those titles have on average the lowest IMDb scores of any region. But switch to Canadian Netflix and you'll have access to some really great titles you wouldn't in the US, like Batman Ninja, Kill Bill 1 and 2, Relic, the live-action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies, the good ones and the bad ones, and the legitimate greatest movie of all time, Babe, a a harrowing story of one young pig's descent into darkness as he fights to become the strongest sheep herder in existence. Am I joking? I don't know! Let's find out together. ExpressVPN, link in the description for three free months. Okay, let's go. In the last couple of years, the Pokemon company has invested in several big online vanity projects that for me capture the heart of Pokemon in a way that maybe some of the modern games struggle to. They literally just announced a new game that looks like what I wanted, so this intro is kind of redundant but I am not rewriting it. And the Pokemon Gotcha music video is the very peak of that. Not only is this video some of the most dynamic and expressive visual design and animation in just anime last year, with some absolutely phenomenal direction from Rei Matsumoto, each frame is brimming with the different stories, characters, and worlds that have been Pokemon for the last 20 years. And fuck, I don't know, if you're the kind of person who can categorize the different stages of your life based on what the most recent Pokemon game was, this video hits with the emotional impact of a dump truck, and that's really cool because it's rare for a fictional property to become ingrained in people's lives like Pokemon has, and rare still for a piece of media to so succinctly capture that feeling. Link to everything I talk about in the description below. Many things happened in the last year that I did not predict, and one of them was that I would sit through a two and a half hour video on the Vampire Diaries, but that's what happens when you're subscribed to Jenny Nicholson, a channel focused on diving into all these strange and forgotten oddities of pop culture and unearthing the bizarreness that lies there. From rejected Star Wars scripts, to the oddly contentious relationship of the hosts of the Hallmark YouTube channel, to her ranking of all 14, 14 Land Before Time movies. My personal favorite being her oddly sweet post-mortem on the Brony fandom in her trip to the final BronyCon. Critically though, it's Jenny's infectious enthusiasm for the things she's talking about combined with her natural charisma and humor that make these videos such a joy. And let her take a very simple format, her in her room talking into a camera, and turn it into some of the most compelling storytelling on YouTube. And I don't know if people appreciate how difficult a thing that is. Seriously, watch what would happen if I tried it. Hi. Uh, welcome to John's Anime Reviews. And today, we're going to be reviewing the first volume of Naruto. And you see, the thing about Naruto is he's meant to be a silent ninja, but in actuality, he wears orange and is very loud. And you'd think that wouldn't work out, but when you actually read it... Awful. Just awful. Awful. But if you want to see someone who can do it well, check out Jenny Nicholson. She is one of my favorite creators on the platform. Okay, I'm about to recommend you a six hour video on a topic you likely do not care about. I am aware this is a tough sell. Tim Rogers of Action Button recently uploaded a bewilderingly large labyrinthian review of Tokumeki Memorial, the PlayStation 1 dating sim responsible for popularizing the genre. And 
Holy shit, this game is an abyss. A bizarrely complex array of systems, subsystems, sub-subsystems, secrets and easter eggs, all of which Rogers has meticulously combed through in an analysis that took him 14 different playthroughs, all the while working towards the impossible goal of courting the god of dating sims, the unattainable one, the one who sits atop a throne made of the skulls of rejected suitors and is one of the most difficult final bosses of all time! High school girl Shiori Fujisaki. And what makes this journey so compelling isn't even just the analysis, but the narrative Rogers builds around it. This legitimate moments of suspense, dread, and tragedy as Rogers hurls himself against the unyielding cliffs of this game, building in his own personal story as he gets lost in poignant nostalgic memories from his own life and romantic history. And look, I get it, it's six hours, what the fuck, but just give this a shot. Currently, Action Button has 50,000 subscribers, and while that is absolutely a following to be respected, I can't help feel that just the sheer originality of this kind of video deserves way more. So come, my dear Wolfpack. Let's do what we do and boost the shit out of a much deserving creator. Sometimes a video just comes out of nowhere and obliterates any preconception of what you thought online media could be. And for me recently, that was the haunting, mesmerizing Pupuria. A three minute animation that's full of the kind of nightmare imagery that's horrifying yet still somehow beautiful enough to hang on a wall. I could try and describe to you what I think is happening here or what it's about, but my feeling is that this is an experience better felt than understood, and a huge part of that is just how technically beautiful it is. Each frame of Pupuria is gorgeous, meticulously drawn with a subtlety and expression that creeps inside you and whispers things you can barely understand. The entire project created by ex-studio Sunrise animator Shingo Tamagawa, a man who burnt out of the Japanese anime industry, spent a year doing nothing before animating Pupuria completely by himself for three years. Stating in an interview that he animates because he wants to feel things he's never felt before. And in that, he was successful. Nothing has ever made me feel the way Pupuria felt. And now more than ever, I feel like that's so important because for many of us right now, strange and beautiful art like Pupuria is our primary means of experiencing new things, letting us escape the misery of a pandemic, the endless lockdown induced isolation. Actually, no, you know what? I talk about the pandemic too much in these videos and just not this time. So let's just forget our troubles with some good, wholesome, I am now going to talk about one of my favourite anime of this season, and that is 1989's When Harry Met Sally. Wait, that doesn't sound quite right. What makes When Harry Met Sally one of the greatest love stories ever made is that if you look at the film as a timeline, the actual romance part of it is contained nearly entirely in the last five minutes, the remaining 91 minutes being dedicated to carefully building up the connection of these two characters, who they are as people, their friendship, their chemistry, investing you in their relationship and making you want it to happen long before the film ever goes there itself. And everything I just described, you could also say about Horamiya. This isn't a relationship built up through longing glances or romantic misunderstandings. This is an expertly crafted connection between two people built to the time they spend together as they slowly come to understand who the other person is and how important a place they hold in each other's lives. And because of that, the little moments of intimacy the show does give us carry the emotional weight of a bomb blast. And so while this is definitely a little softer than my usual recommendations, it's a great watch for anyone looking for a story about a believable, meaningful connection between two people. Okay, so after a conversation with a talking undead firefly, you are given an egg from a gashapon machine, at which point you find yourself transported into a creepy abandoned school where the egg hatches into a teenage girl who you must protect for a set period of time from hordes of furious murder children and do this enough and two talking mannequins will bring someone you love back to life. Cool? Cool. This is Wonder Egg Priority, a gorgeously animated show with some of the most beautifully striking character designs I have seen in quite a while. The adolescent 
adolescence and personalities of these girls expressed beautifully through both their outfits and color palettes. Like protagonist I, a genuinely happy-go-lucky person streaked with guilt and trauma over her friend's suicide. That juxtaposition expressed through the joyous yellow hues of her hoodie contrasted with the deeply somber blues of her hair. And it's that kind of visual expression that is so critical to Wonder Egg Priority because for the sheer insanity of its premise, this is a show built around the trauma faced by young girls. Those traumas taking physical form in the shape of wonder killers, massive monsters that haunt the dream world based around concepts like abuse, self-harm, bullying, and suicide. To the point that if you are someone who is maybe a little sensitive to those issues, you might want to show a little caution going into this one. But if you're cool with it, this is genuinely one of the freshest feeling anime I've seen in a while. The beautiful thing about the opening 20 minutes of Ride Your Wave is how it pulls you into the peaceful, carefree existence of two young people living in a sleepy seaside town. The film taking joy in the visual expression of all these simple little moments. The brewing of a cup of coffee, watching an omelette fall open on some rice, or the look in someone's eyes as they're really starting to fall for another person for the first time. As we watch our protagonist stumble from acquaintances to friends to something more. All those little moments combining into a romantic, serene existence that feels just perfect and it does not last. I don't have time to justify full spoilers here, but what I loved about this movie is how it creates this perfect period of time in these characters' lives where everything feels exactly as it should, and then forces them to move past it. In a story about how even the most important things in our lives cannot last, but ultimately it's our memories of the people we love and our connection to them that shapes who we become in the future. One of my favorite games from last gen was the Game Baker's Fury, a shit difficult bullet hell boss rush in which you die over and over and over. And that's what makes the studio's follow up game, Haven, such a surprise. The opening screen explicitly tells you that this is not a game about difficulty. Instead, this is a story about spending time with you and Kai, a young couple stranded on an alien planet. Your days spent exploring its ethereal, otherworldly landscapes and discovering its wildlife, your nights spent cooking, talking, and fucking. Some of it gets pretty steamy. I'm not gonna say I think every part of this game works or that all the dialogue lands, but what I do enjoy about it is that this is explicitly a game about exploring the relationship of these two people. And you can feel that in every tiny mechanic, from how you level up you and Kai's intimacy, how you glide through its open world together, as well as the simple but innovative dual turn-based combat where you simultaneously control both characters. With writing that's genuine enough that you really feel like you're experiencing a messy, complicated, but ultimately loving connection between these people, which is great because right now, a game about exploring a new world and experiencing a new relationship is just what I need considering Ireland's COVID numbers are so bad that- No, no, we're not going there. We're not doing that. Next topic. One of the things that made Earthbound such a unique and important game was that it was this weird lighthearted adventure and yet there was always the feeling of something more adult and sinister creeping just beyond its edges. And that is also the feeling I get from Omori. This is actually a Kickstarter game from the indie clothing label Omocat, whose illustrations focus on themes like childhood, nostalgia, and otaku culture. And you can feel that a aesthetic woven into the fabric of this game. From its beautiful pixel overworld to its gorgeously illustrated turn-based battles, it all breeds with the sweet pastel aesthetic of a mid-2010s Tumblr blog spiked with something much darker. I will say the story does take a little while to get going and currently the game is buggier than I would like, but every hour I spent with Omori pulled me into its world and characters a little more. That story being of a group of friends who lost touch a long time ago, their individual traumas corrupting the fantasy world they now inhabit. So if you're into games like Anodyne, Lisa the Painful, or Yume Nikki, Omori is well worth spending some time with. Okay, you see this cute shit? You see these adorable little pixel characters? This, friends, is a fucking lie. 
a sugared shell housing one of the cruelest, most hateful souls in video games. Every object in Spelunky 2 has its own rule set to be learned and mastered, each object able to react with other objects which can lead to these dynamic, chemistry-like chain reactions that can go very wrong very quickly, snatching your run away from you, sending you spiraling back to the very top of its procedurally generated world. There are no experience points, there are no unlockables, there are no upgrades. Your sole means of improvement, the thing you level up, being your understanding of this game's world, monsters and items, with each death gleaning a little more insight into the mechanics of this world and how it works. And when it all starts to click, holy shit, you are the best, you are invincible, you are the god of this domain only for the game to snatch it all away in an instant and whisper, you will never beat this game, leaving you withered, gasping, and desperate for one more try. And that is the beauty and agony of Spelunky 2. Twenty twenty was a uh, strange year for wrestling, but we still got some barn-burningly good wrestling matches. That's right, literally matches that were so good they would incite you to commit arson on large agricultural structures designed to house grain, hay, straw, or livestock. Am I becoming incoherent? Absolutely. Wrestling. Possibly my favorite match of the year being Rhea Ripley versus Io Shirai. Two performers I had a lot of affection for before this match, but holy shit. The story of the high-flying Shirai unloading every weapon in her tech arsenal just to survive the onslaught of the monstrously powerful Ripley to me elevated the status of both performers to two of the absolute best in the world. Just like Wrestle Kingdom's Jeff Cobb versus the dragon Shingo Takagi, which was the visual equivalent of two skyscrapers growing arms and beating the shit out of one another. Cobb and Takagi, along with others like the limitless one Keith Lee, currently redefining what big men can be in wrestling. And speaking of big men, you ever see any of those old Greek works of art where it's just two men physically breaking each other? Well, NXT UK's Walter vs. Dragunov was like watching one of those come to life. A goddamn wince-inducing story of the tenacious Dragunov just fighting with every atom of his body to dethrone the immovable god of NXT UK, Walter, in a narrative of facing the impossibly insurmountable that was ugly and brutal and beautiful in a way that only wrestling can be. And I'd also say that of AEW's Winter is Coming showdown between Cody Rhodes and Brody Lee. This one has a little story behind it. For years, John Huber, aka Brody Lee, languished around the WWE midcard, mainly seen as the guy who stood beside Bray Wyatt. But there was always something about him. His look, his smash mouth style. He's the kind of performer you'd think, man, this guy could be really big if he ever got a proper shot only for him to disappointingly be cut from WWE in 2019, before being signed to AEW in 2020 and given the monstrous heel push he's always deserved, emerging as one of the company's top villains and leader of the Dark Order faction, being genuinely really entertaining in the backstage sections while also terrifying in the ring, climaxing in his absolute war with Cody Rhodes for the TNT Championship. The tragic parts being that this was Huber's last match. He passed away six weeks later due to a lung condition, leaving behind a wife and two children, and it is, oh, devastating. There is some comfort in the fact that his career ended with him doing the best work of his entire life and showing the world his true potential. The outpouring of love from the wrestling community making it apparent what a great person this villainous heel actually was. He will be dearly missed. 2020 sucked for many reasons and I think that's why I found the music I felt drawn to more somber and morose than even usual for me. And one artist that really stood out being this person, who if Google Translate is to be believed and it isn't, is a Chinese artist known as Understatements. 
And fuck, man, this music. When I think of 2020, I think of the conversations I did not have, the people I could not experience. I think of looking out into the world and being met with the sight of institutions preying on the people they're meant to protect and fucking lunatics distorting public consciousness to the point that all manner of insanity is now justifiable. It was a year where our lives shrank and we lost too much of who we are. And in moments like that, it's music like this that is the only thing that makes sense to me. A dystopian ambient acknowledgement that things are not alright but that hopefully Someday they can be. And I think it's also that feeling that made this final thing I want to talk about today resonate so hard. If you watch enough of my videos, you know that I like weird people with weird perspectives. And John Wilson is a man that has spent years filming footage around New York City, capturing all these strange, weird, and fucked up things that happen there. And in his new six part series, How To with John Wilson, uses that footage to build these hilarious, fascinating, and just bizarre mini documentaries that feel like some surreal fusion of Nathan Fielder and Louis Theroux. As John, in attempting to answer some of life's simpler questions, falls down these rabbit holes of human subculture, his journeys taking him to strangely aggressive nihilistic referee dinners, conventions on the Mandela effect, and I can't even get into where episode 3 goes, but... Wow, the world sure is full of different people pursuing happiness in their own strange and broken ways. And I don't know, this one just really hit me. I miss the feeling of being able to get lost in a city. I miss the feeling of sitting down in a cafe with a cup of coffee and just staring as the world goes by. Or getting into an oddly intimate conversation with someone you've never met before and will never see again. I think on some level, this show kind of let me relive those days. Until episode 6, when John gets on a bus, and there's snow in there, and he goes to the shop, and all the food's gone, and oh god, it's the pandemic! The pandemic ruined this show! Oh Jesus Christ, there's no escaping it! It's just everywhere! What are we gonna do?! Forget the past You can't forget love and pride 